Welcome to another live segment of BuddyCast. I'm your host, Nick Sorensen, here with my great friend and current president of the LPA, Low People of America, Mike Povinelli. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Happy to Glad be here. To have you. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Now, you are the current standing president of Little People of America, correct? Correct. All righty. Um, can you describe for us a little bit, for those of who don't know, what the LPA is in your own terms? Sure. Uh, LPA stands for Little People of America, and it's an organization that's 63 years old. It was founded by uh, actor Billy Barty uh, back in 1957. Um, somewhat as a publicity stunt, but also as a way to gain awareness for people of short stature around the country. Um, you know, even uh, 20, 30 years before uh, 1957, c circus sideshows were basically the one of the main ways for little people to gain employment and to uh, be allowed out in their communities, to be honest. Uh, disabled people as a whole, um, there were things called created the ugly laws back in the 20s that uh, shunned people. You weren't allowed to even leave your house if you uh, had a noticeable disability. So anyway, 57 Billy Barty started this organization. 63 years later, it's an organization of over 8,000 members, uh, the largest advocacy and social organization for little people in the world. Hmm. Interesting. Now, how long have you been involved in the in the LPA? Well, well, I I think I got involved um, really early, like uh, my entire life. I think my parents found out about LPA uh, when I was about two years old, uh, when they had uh, gotten my diagnosis from a, a doctor who was familiar with LPA, got me in the organization, and I grew up in the organization. I met my wife through the organization. My kids are little people. Uh, they've now been in, their, in the organization their entire lives. So it's it's been a huge part of my life for as long as I can remember. Awesome. Awesome. So when did you first start like getting involved with like board positions or <laughs> when you became president even? Sure. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I spent uh, 40 years of my life just taking from the organization, just using it as a way to socialize, meet people and, and have an excuse to go to different parts of the country. And uh, it was about I'd say about six or seven years ago, well, maybe about 10 years ago, a good friend of mine um, who's been a part of the board for years uh, asked me to take on a volunteer role. And uh, uh, I, I sort of begrudgingly did it, feeling uh, guilt, if nothing else, uh, to try to raise some funds. This was during the financial crisis for LPA. And it went and it went well. And then a couple of years later, there was a, a board position open and I I figured, you know, I've got the, it's a good point in my life where I can maybe decide to give back. And I wanted to look into doing something like that. And so I ran for the membership director and I got that. And then three years later, I found myself running for president. I mm -hmm. think I just saw a, um, an opportunity. There were a lot of uh, issues that LPA uh, was on the precipice of. And I thought that I might be able to contribute um, some energy and some momentum to uh, really move the organization, continue to move the organization forward. I mean, it's been propelling along for years now and some great leaders before me. And I just wanted to carry on that tradition and, and keep uh, improving on what I think is a profound, uh, really life-changing organization. Awesome, awesome. So can you explain your role a little bit as the president? Like what you do you maybe in like a day-to-day -day basis or? Like when it comes down to the business? Yeah, you know, um, I wish I had like a, a, a smooth answer for that one. I uh, I mean, I, to be honest, I did not know what I was getting into when I became president. Uh, and, you know, you hear that like that joke about United States presidents that you don't know how to be president until you actually do it. And on a much smaller scale, no pun intended, it's the same with the LPA president. Uh, I um my day to day is answering a lot of emails. There's a lot of um, a lot of requests for um, uh, assistance in um, people finding out about the organization. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's some media to do. There's a lot of organizational 
we have 13 districts and we have um, 70 chapters. So it's very much a pyramid. So each one of those chapters has their own issue. Each one of those districts can have issues and they all kind of funnel up when, when things can't get resolved early. Um, but it's a lot of visionary uh, work with advocacy and with um, where we're gonna hold our events and uh, what sort of uh, projects we're gonna be working on and how we can do outreach and um, how we can you know, change opinions. So it kind of is a surprise every day when I open my email to figure out what, what needs to be done today. And some days are light and some days are super busy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say there's a family that's just experiencing dwarfism for the first time. They find out that their child, their second child has dwarfism, and this is a whole new ballpark for them because this is the first in their family. What, what would you personally, or in the terms of LPA, like advise them? What would you, how would you make them feel more comfortable with the situation at hand? Well, I mean, I think that one thing that we try to acknowledge is that if you haven't, if you don't have experience with dwarfism, it can feel quite shocking and daunting to be given this diagnosis, especially there's, uh, I think there's an issue with the medical community of, of not um, of being very clinical about uh, this kind of information to a new family. You've, you've set up a dream about what you think your child will be like. I mean, everybody who's, who's gone through pregnancy, you kind of imagine what your kid's gonna be like and how you're gonna parent and what they're gonna grow into. And with one diagnosis, it can take a left turn. Now that left turn doesn't mean it's a negative or that it's it's worse in any way. It just means it's different. And so what we try to do is get in as early as possible, acknowledge that this is a new reality, it's a new paradigm, but uh, your kid's gonna be fine. There's resources out there. There's a community, a thriving community out there of support, both for the parents, the siblings, and the, and the child himself or herself. And in, in many ways, uh, I think, and I think most people in the organization feel like our difference is something that um, really uh, enhances our life and, and it's given us a new perspective and uh, provides uh, diversity and um, some empathy that, that this world is never, um, never has enough of. So I, I think there's some really kind of great things about uh, growing up with a difference. And we try to instill that um, dwarf pride, is, if you call it, into the family as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, what do you, you mentioned like parents' hopes and dreams for their children. What are your hopes and dreams for the LPA? Because this is kind of like, this is from what you've taken on a little bit of your child, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Um, I think you know, we've we've reached the point where uh, for years, I think um, we as a community just wanted acceptance and we wanted belonging. You know, I think it's a there's an arc with uh, almost any marginalized group, and we certainly are um, such a unique uh, and 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 less robust size uh, a group that we've sort of fallen at the tail end of of some of these. Um, uh, disability or diversity or ethnicity um, empowerment uh, uh, experiences. And for us, you know, we wanted just acceptance for so long. Um, uh, you know, treat us, treat us like anyone else and, and you know, uh, just give us, uh, uh, you know, give us a chance. And I think we've gotten to that point where um, because people have grown up in the organization, because people have thrived in the organization, because you have some real outgoing powerhouses, we've come to a point in, in the next generation that they want to see not just acceptance, but they want equal rights and they want uh, full access to everything that everyone else has. And it's, and it's really this amazing and beautiful um, pride movement in a way. Um, so I want LPA to be the leader of that movement of, um, you know, awareness and uh, while maintaining our community and, and empowering the people within our community to, to achieve whatever they want to. Then there's also, you know, there's a much more um, less idealistic issues such as, I mean, we always have to fundraise. So um, I wanna keep this organization, we have lots of goals and, you know, some of those goals cost money. So getting um, uh, fundraising from outside the organization 
as opposed to within its own membership. And uh, there's, uh, without getting too deep, but there's a, a big issue with um, pharmaceutical trials these days where uh, there's a handful of pharmaceutical companies working on uh, treatments um, that uh, essentially um, change some of the dynamics of a uh, certain type of dwarfism called a counterplasia. And um, typically what they're paying attention to is growth velocity, height. And we feel like that is not an important aspect of our quality of life. We have some medical issues that we would certainly like dealt with, like spinal stenosis and, and sleep apnea and that sort of thing. But um, height is not a focus of ours and not an interest. And it's not something we want um, cured or really even addressed. And um, so there's going to be, you know, there's a constant struggle with making the greater community aware of the fact that we don't focus on that. We find our height to be an interesting uh, element of diversity within the larger community that's important, and we want to maintain that. All righty. How do you think the LPA can strive a little more, like, push towards understanding for the outside community, in your opinion? Well, I think some of it has to do with... Um, you know, it's access. It's it's having um, little people uh, have positions, whether in the workplace or within their communities or in the media uh, or in politics, that they're seen. Because I think it's a it's easy myth to dispel once you meet a little person and get to know them that they are just like everybody else, and they're really there's. Um, there's nothing different about them other than they have these added, uh, uh, um, you know, issues uh, because the the surrounding world doesn't fit us. Um, but besides that, there's no reason that we can't achieve anything anybody else does and have the same hopes and dreams and flaws and attributes as anybody else. So when you have a person on television, when you have uh, a, a person in politics, when you have a, a, a CEO of a corporation, um, when you have a uh, somebody giving TED Talks or a comedian um, who's a little person, it, 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 it dispels a lot of those myths and, and people realize, you know, I mean, look at what Peter Dinklage on Game of Thrones, how normalized that's made uh, dwarfism and things like Little People, Big World. Um, that's not the, those aren't the outliers. Those, uh, you know, we all exist like that. And so uh, it's, it's mostly about access to um, just awareness of us. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of awareness, October is actually Dwarfism Awareness Month. How would you like, what are some things you like to do during that month to create more? Like, what are some things that you personally have seen that has really spread the awareness during that month? Right. I mean, we've uh, a couple of things. Uh, LPA the last few years has, um, we have a, a pretty uh, robust Facebook following and uh, we've managed to put out Facebook posts every day in that month of awareness and also encourage people to send videos about, you know, dwarf pride or, or what they, what they um, feel best about uh, being different or being a little person. And last year, I think they reached 420,000 um, uh, hits on those uh, Facebook posts collectively. So that's been a great way to spread awareness. And then, um, you know, this is close to your heart. Uh, we do something, um, uh, October 25th is uh, Billy Barty's birthday, and that's the uh, um, we call that Dwarfism Awareness Day. And uh, so, in various um, states and cities and counties across the country, people have gotten um, proclamations that uh, uh, having the city or the state make that the official Dwarfism Awareness Day. And I believe you uh, were able to accomplish that in Pennsylvania. Yep. And we are um, hoping that within the next few years, we'll be able to make it a national proclamation uh, across the country as other countries actually have. They focused heavily on that, like Mexico. And um, there's a lot of other countries out there that um, the Philippines that have it as a national, ho or national um, proclamated day. And we'll get there too. And congratulations to you on, on making you. that happen in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have the official document right over, uh, if you can see it on the messy dresser there, right over there on the dresser. Oh, yeah, sure. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I still That's need a big to win get, for us. 
And that was totally like you just out there being an activist and and seeing Mm -hmm. a need for awareness and making it happen. I mean, Mm -hmm. us as an organization, we're a volunteer organization. We do what we can, uh, but really change happens by grassroots levels and by people seeing a need and um, seeing that there's a lack of awareness and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And you're a perfect testament to that. Thank you. Now, the one thing that inspired HR 497 for me to do something was the Zach Brown band incident. Mm. Uh, for those that don't know, the Zach Brown band last year hired some little people to do a wrestling stunt on stage. And that actually caused a lot of, for me personally, it caused a lot of like, I felt like it was a major setback because after all we're doing, it just, you know, there's a million people at this concert. You know, there was even a little person working at that, at the um, ballpark there. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking like, I just put myself in his shoes and just went, what if that were me? You know, like just walking out of that scene. Now I am petrified because, you know, concerts have a high alcohol consumption rate. Um, all it takes is one intoxicated individual to go, Hey, look, you were, you were one of those guys on stage. <laughs> and all of a sudden someone like you and me is now running for our life or something like that. Cause it could be a big heavy set guy who could have had one too many tonight. And, but, um, So the point of this question is when you see things like this happen on the media, say you see like um, a little person get thrown across the TV uh, TV set or you see like just something like this happen where you think, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, why after all this work, what are some ways to combat that in your opinion? Well, I mean, I think, there's a few things. It's I, and I agree with you. It it can be uh, really disheartening to see um, that we make progress, and then I mean we deal with it all the time. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, people using um, our height and our stature as a derogatory, uh, you know, put down. Uh, Bill Crystal, who's a, a conservative um, columnist, uh, very well respected. Uh, you know, he, he's on TV all the time and writes for uh, various newspaper outlets. Um, he sent out a, a, a post, a Twitter post the other day that uh, it was when uh, Trump was um, had that interview below the Abraham Lincoln um, memorial. And he, he used the word midget and was uh, referring to Trump as a, a political midget or something like that. And, you know, besides the fact that that word is offensive to us for uh, reasons that you know, are, are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, just that comparison that height is um, it, it is a derogatory thing, like diminished height somehow means you're less than is something that we have to fight all the time. I mean, it's, uh, it's ingrained in our society that the taller you are, the more respected you are basically. And we obviously feel that's completely not true. Um, so, you know, it's it's constantly putting out fires like the Zach Brown band and, and, and Bill Crystal and Bill Maher and and uh, plenty of comedians who just are lazy and use midget as a as a, a really easy way to to gain, um, you know, a cheap laugh. Um, so we go after them Saturday Night Live. But uh, it really is trying to change the dynamics that uh, we're, we're kind of like the last accepted group that you can make fun of. Um, and, and, and that, you know, feels very frustrating because uh, this is something that none of it, I mean, this, it was a born attribute. Um, we have pride that we don't want to change ourselves. And uh, it feels uh, really disheartening when other people um, just use you as a punchline or worse, and, and you find yourself in, in danger. Um, so it's going to be a constant struggle and it's about awareness and it's about empowerment. Um, but it's also, you know, it's changing the dynamics of even, um, uh, we need like in the media, when you bring up, we need, uh, little people in writer's rooms. We need little people's stories to be told as opposed to having some average height person's idea of what it must be like to be a little person even for as far and as uh, vast as peter dinklage's career has been you know he's always somebody else's version of what it must be like to be little as opposed to 
how I think you and I and, and Peter and his private life experience it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the term midget, you know, I personally find that offensive because a, I know the history behind it with PT Barnum and all that. And um, B, because just the way that it's used against us, like just the way that, you know, when it, uh, 90, 98% of the time that someone's using it, it's more of a, hey, look at that, you know? What For those who maybe don't know out there who are tuning into this and have little to no experience with dwarfism, what are some acceptable terms for, instead of using the M word? in your opinion, like, what would you? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm, I think everybody has their own personal preferences. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, like you said, pretty universally midget is um, not <coughs> acceptable. Uh, but I mean, little person certainly uh, is the name of our organization and, and that works. And I, I'm comfortable with dwarf. I have dwarfism, it's a medical mm -hmm. term. And um, so I'm comfortable with that. Uh, and then, I mean, generally, my name is the one that I really like the most. Uh, you know, I don't need to be labeled by my physical attributes. I'm, I'm Mark Provenelli, and um, that's my name, and that's how you should refer to me. Beautiful answer. Beautiful. Now, I want to ask you this personally. I know you have a little bit of acting history, or acting history. Am I correct? That is correct. Yes. I, um, if you don't mind me asking, what have you starred in? What are some of the like key roles? Uh, so, I mean, things you might've seen me in are, um, a, a few movies, Water for Elephants, um, uh, uh, Mirror, Mirror, um, movie called The Hot Flashes with Brooke Shields and Wanda Sykes and, uh, Virginia Madsen, um, uh, TV shows. I've been on Modern Family and Criminal Minds, and I was a series regular on a TV show called Are You There, Chelsea? on NBC and um, I don't know, plenty of other uh, TV shows and films, um, but there's, and, and a lot of theater. I've done a lot of theater as well. Yeah. Have you ever had a role that like, or like gone to audition for a role that you take one look at the script, like you take one look at your character description and think, eh, like you just get that gut feeling that this is more of like one of those joke roles or like, something intended, like, as we mentioned before, to downplay dwarfism? It happens all the time. It's, uh, I mean, I would say, I mean, it's gotten better, but bordering on 50% of the things that come across my desk, uh, I don't even go in for it, let alone, you know, get there and, and have second thoughts. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, again, it's, um, people's uh it's a very cheap and easy way to get a joke and it's uh i think people think it's the the last acceptable acceptable uh you know jokes that you can't make about ethnicities and about other disabilities that people would find outrageous for some reason they think that it's okay with our community and so it's a it's a constant fight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right i think i'm going to wrap it up with this one question um, in your own words, what's your advice for when it comes to dwarfism? Like, what's your advice for, say, families that have little to no experience but could be impacted one day for the outside community, for just even little people in general who are, you know, like have to sometimes struggle with who they are, you know? What would be your advice in general? I, I think my advice is it goes back to the organization. It goes back to finding a community that understands uh, without belaboring it. I mean, we get together all the time and very little of it's we talk about our dwarfism. You know, we we're friends and friends far beyond um, our physical attributes, but uh, our shared commonality about our experiences um, it just is a really reassuring thing. And it's it's nice to be around a community of people who kind of know what you're going through and their strength in numbers. And uh, I mean, it's it it's just this immediate bond. And so I think that getting in as adults, I mean, parents, uh, average height um, with a child with dwarfism, there's nothing uh, healthier than meeting other parents who have gone through it and whose kids are older and they can kind of teach you the ropes and how to navigate through school and bullying and, and all the, and surgeries and 
all the things that uh, sometimes are, are challenges for people with dwarfism. But all in all, I mean, it, it, it's far less interesting than people make it out to be, being mm -hmm. a little person. It really is. I mean, it is uh, something I wear every time I go out of my house, but I'm constantly reminded that I'm a little person. I don't walk around knowing I'm a little person. I'm just, I'm just Mark Povinelli getting through my day. And it's only when some ignorant person reminds me of that, or when there's a situation that the, the um, I lack access to something because this world isn't built for my size, am I made aware of it? My, my biggest disability is other people's uh, perceptions of us, not my own physical stature. Mm -hmm. I actually forgot this one question. Um, you know, the, L the LPA also has conventions, which is pretty unique. You know, a lot of, a lot of organizations, this isn't something that usually happens. Um, let's talk about a national convention here. Like what, what goes on in those cases? Well, I mean, our national conferences are, I, I mean, like you said, I don't, I don't even know what to compare them to. They, it's like a, it's like a high school reunion meets a, a wedding meets a, uh, college um, lecture meets, uh, you know, a, a vacation, um, you know, like some kind of uh, family reunion vacation. It's it's amazing and a, and an athletic event because we have seven days, uh, about sixteen hours a day of nonstop wall to wall activities. We have workshops in the mornings for parents. Um, we have workshops on adaptations and about the workplace and educate you know ieps and five or fours and then we have um we have, have athletic events during the days we have activities out uh into the city you know um whatever is the big attractions uh we take buses out there we uh we have a talent show one evening we have a fashion show we have a banquet we have dances that go till two in the morning every night um and anytime there isn't something specific going on there's you'll find hundreds of people hanging out in the lobby just bonding and socializing and it's people from all over the country all over the world we have uh anywhere from 1800 to 2200 people that come to this conference and it's a life-changing event it absolutely um is a shocking moment to see to walk into an, a, a hotel and realize that you're not the one with the difference anymore that everyone there is like you and um and it's interesting because then you have to uh shed kind of this persona that you've built around yourself because of your height and figure out who you are outside of being a little person and it's really this empowering moment of of self-awareness and self-discovery i think too by just realizing that this person uh isn't defined by their height. My, I'm not defined by my height when I'm at a conference. I'm defined by who I am as a person and how I treat other people and relate to other people. So, um, but it's a lot of fun too. <laughs> and, uh, and and really, uh, I mean, uh, like I said, I've got lifelong friends through the organization. Some of the, my best friends in my life, I met my wife through the organization. It's, uh, I don't know where I'd be without it. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend anybody that gets a chance to go once we get out of this situation uh to, to if you can ever to get there it's it's a uh, it's a life-changing event yep now final the real final question where can people go to learn more about the lpa learn more about dwarfism where's some uh, good resources? great question yeah uh so lpa's uh website is lpaonline.org and uh, it's got an amazing amount of resources, medical resources, information, history, articles, um, tells you about chapter, local chapter events. Thank you, that's great. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we also have a Facebook page. Um, I think you just type in Little People of America on Facebook. And then um, again, a lot of different chapters and districts will have their own Facebook pages. Usually you have to be a member, but for the national one, you don't have to be a member uh, of the organization to, um, be part of that Facebook page. Uh, so those are our main two um, social media outlets or in our website. All right. Well, that was Mark Povinelli. Thank you so much for joining us. I learned a lot about the LPA today, you know, and it was just truly incredible talking to you. Thank you so much for helping me spread awareness. 
My pleasure. Happy to do it. All Take right, care, man. Nate. You too. Thanks for everything, my friend. You bet.